You're watching Bread and Roses, a weekly political social magazine that's broadcast in English and Persian by a new channel TV. Hello everyone, I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fadi Bospuya. We've been away for a month and we are very glad to be back. Yeah, definitely. We hope you had a fantastic new year and are looking forward to 2016. As part of this program, we'll be bringing you a speech by AC Grading at the annual gathering of the Council of Ex-Muslim and the Campaign for One Law for All in Britain. We'll also be talking about the sex assaults in Köln and other cities, the so-called elections in Iran, as well as, of course, a blasphemous baking pans. You've got to watch out for those blasphemous baking pans. And a wonderful uh, nude protest against the sex attacks in Germany. Stay with us. two issues that we'd like to discuss in this week's program. One, of course, is the elections in Iran. Elections, that should definitely be something that goes in quotes. It's for the Assembly of Experts as well as for the Islamic Assembly or, you know, the Majlis or Parliament. And of course, it's, it's a farce, you know, to call um, anything that takes place there as an election where people actually have a choice um, is, is a bit farcical, really. Yes, it insults everybody's intelligence. Um, because to stand for election in Iran, you have to qualify quite a number of things. You need to uh, have allegiance to this whole system of Islamic regime, its hi a hierarchy, and um, otherwise you can't stand, you can't even put your name on paper. And after you qualify for all of those... It's still not enough. It's not enough. <laughs> then you'll have somebody uh, sitting over there and saying, actually, mm, your beard yes, is not long enough. No, yes, no, 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 yes, yeah. sort of thing. So a lot of people actually, even friends of the... Um, different factions of the Islamic regime, friends of the president of the Islamic regime, mm -hmm. they can't stand for elections. So, so, I mean, you, you do have people saying, oh, well, you know, hopefully the reformists will win. But, you know, reform has a real meaning in the world. You just can't call yourself reformist and that's it, you know. You've got to see where have the so-called reformists actually made real reforms in the law. And that, that's a very important aspect of reform, changes in the law, changes to Islamic rules. And clearly there hasn't been any real change, any fundamental change. And it, it, it is a show, um, you know, and of course there is infighting between the two factions. Um, and from that infighting, people do get to use that space in order to resist and to protest. But effectively, either faction coming to power isn't really going to fundamentally change the lives of people uh, absolutely. in Iran. Uh, and um, um, the leader of the Islamic regime uh, very clearly has said the that... supreme spiritual yes, leader. You have to say that in that tone, <laughs> don't you? Um, he's, very, he's very clearly said that he encourages everybody to participate in voting for the people that he's... Um, he wants. He, he wants. <laughs> you, you can vote, you can vote, but you can't stand. I mean, that, that's the thing, that there's no universal, universal right to stand for elections. It, it's anyway. a brilliant. His, his basic, his exact quote is, I've said that those who oppose the system should vote, and not that they should send someone who doesn't accept the system to the majlis. Uh, of course, that's the whole concept of Islamic democracy, isn't it? But uh, what, what's funny is there's this uh, satirical account, Twitter account, called Ayatollah Tanosoli, which means Ayatollah Genitalia. And he's basically said, yes, the people must uh, participate in the elections uh, to help the system defeat its enemies. And of course, then he says the enemies of the system are the people. And that's exactly the, the situation. This is a regime that is completely antithetical to any sorts of rights and, and freedoms. And one of, one of the things that we need to um, be mindful of, and you will see that in the next four weeks um, in the media, there are people who try to create this illusion that this is actually an election and it's going to have any meaningful impact on people's lives. And one of those characters in in the media would be trust me shooting everybody yeah. and what, what has yeah, she said well, well she said something uh, where she said you know the the iranian regime has now made peace with an enemy which is the u.s for 37 years and why can it not make peace with its own people really i mean the iranian regime has slaughtered an entire generation it should be 
prosecuted for crimes against humanity and she's talking about making peace with the people i mean that that's a, again the narrative that the way she's framing the, uh, the issue about nuclear agreement islamic regime of iran was forced to give up its nuclear project hasn't made peace it's continuing its activity and terrorist activities abroad everywhere and against the people uh, as and, well and in internally in iran so election is this election is not going to have any impact the, the real change will come from people people actually as always, forcing people the power. islam forcing the islamic regime <laughs> of iran and and making sure that they are you know they are muzzled that's yeah. what, what it is let's now go to discuss the other topic we want to just uh, i'm being mindful of time and that is of course the mass sex assaults on women in public spaces in Köln, germany other cities across germany as well as some other european countries like sweden uh, switzerland and austria just to give you some statistics from the attack in Köln, more than 883 women have so far filed criminal complaints including 497 cases of direct sex assault, including three rapes. And only, only eight people have been detained, which is in and of itself an outrage. And one of the things we'll see, various political tendencies and groups, we try to uh, define this uh, or give it their own, project their own uh, sort of politics. For example, you'll see the right wing would come and say, look, this is a refugee issue. And that if you get rid of all the refugees, they won't, you won't have th this problem. problem. Uh, you'll, you, you'll have the head of the police in, in, in uh, Korn and the imam of Korn actually saying, that's the, you know, what do you expect? If people go out uh, the way they behave on New Year's Eve, that's the result. You need to, uh, you, you need to change your behavior. And then of course you've got yourself. the left that is completely, you know, pretending like the problem doesn't even exist and that nothing really or, out of the or there is happened. a problem, but this is not the issue that uh, uh, they, they want to have a look. They don't want to mention the, the religious right wing who have a major influence in this. It's a lot, there is actually anti uh, woman misogyny everywhere. Let's deal with it. Yes. This is a general issue. They try to normalize yeah. this and actually yeah. take away the, the um, attention that has been generated and needs to be continued to be generated i mean there's a wonderful essay written by algerian sociolo sociologist mariama hele lucas and in it she says you know the usual response is either you know a, a, a response which tries to ignore what's happened or one that tries to perpetrate racism uh, there, and the problem is that europe is not learning from our experiences the experiences of those of us who have been fighting against uh, the Islamist uh, religious right for many decades. And she gives examples of how similar attacks against women in the public space has taken place in, of course, Tahrir Square, which we all know about, but also in Tunis, in Algeria and other places, and how this is linked to a larger political movement um, that is imposing its points of view and um, you know misogyny in various ways whether it's via Sharia courts whether it's via gender segregation and the veil or whether it is diminishing the space for women in in public absolutely and the fact that this was organized they, they had a very clear hallmark of the organization within it, it actually repeated itself this pattern repeated itself in in, in different European cities and Nobody talks about the right-wing Islamist movement. Remember that East London, the Sharia... Um, Ma what was that? The Sharia the, police? Sort yeah, of they, they, they started going yeah. around and telling people to cover up. This is a Muslim area. Stop drinking. It's, this, this is continuation of exactly the same thing. And that's what we need to... You know, what actually Europe needs to come and face the issue, uh, you know, look it in the eye and have no... Um, you know, inhibition of dealing with these issues and it, it needs to be properly investigated. Yeah, and I think, well. you know, we do need to look at this not as an issue of identity politics or migration uh, because this is a political issue. You're not going to solve Islamism and its assault on women, which is one important pillar of Islamism, with English classes, with shaving people's beards, with, uh, you know, um, I don't know, um, uh, stopping, uh, closing borders. This is an international, global issue. To fight it, we have to fight this political movement in, in its various forms, not just terrorism, but also the misogyny uh, against women. And, th you know, this is, I think what happened in Kong is a reflection of that. When you empower Islamism or the soft Islamists because you want to give, um, you know, you think that it will help against the, the, violent, the, the jihadist. violent jihadists, this is what it opens up the space for, violence against women.
absolutely. And I mean, that's, uh, this is um, something that we need to look at it, you know, it has different dimensions. We need to look at all, all these aspects. You know, we, we deal, we have to close the space for, for, for this for ideology, which is yeah. actually perpetrated by the right wing religious groups, particularly Islamist group, that uh, it creates a space for anti woman misogynist environment that th these things could happen. And I just want to end by reading uh, something short from Mary Mahela Lucas's article. I, I encourage everyone to, to read this. I think it is the most brilliant piece written on the sex attacks in, in Europe. But she says that what's at stake here goes far beyond women's rights. It's a project to establish a theocratic society in which, amongst many others, women's rights are severely curtailed. The concerted action on 31st of December at the European level and its challenge to women's place in the public space plays exactly the same role as the sudden invention of the so-called Islamic veil. It's a show of force and visibility. And it says the you know the fact that there's still so many questions that haven't really been even asked in the public space, which is the concerted nature of these simultaneous attacks in five different countries and nearly a dozen cities in Europe. She says it leaves one speechless in the wake of so much dishonesty, so much blindness, and so much political perversity. The insane fatwa in the week is uh, on baking pans, basically, and uh, it's, you know, a horrendous crime has taken place in Indonesia where uh, someone reported that some baking pans that they had bought had been covered in verses of the Quran. And this is the commissioner of police had to intervene, they've opened the investi criminal investigation file <laughs> and they've gone and, and seen, yes, there's more evidence of his crime. They've seen more pages of Quran b being used to wrap uh, baking trays. Well, and there, there are six, actually. They, they've found almost uh, as many uh, baking pads as they've managed to find. They had a news conference <laughs> <laughs> and told the reporters that, you know, we can't allow this. because And they interviewed the customer who said, look, when I saw this, I was shocked to see that the <laughs> pan has it, been wrapped in prison. It's basically, yeah, it, this is blasphemy, of course. And uh, unfortunately, as the news report says, no one has yet been charged with blasphemy. So if, you know, if you do find the offending baking pans, <laughs> please do, you know, tell the commissioner so he can actually rest assured and then go after some real criminals. Yeah, uh, some of the Islamists in uh, Indonesia, I think, who are causing a lot more havoc than a baking pan. And he is... That might just be too He's much. going to be very busy. <laughs> <laughs> December 2015, we had a end year event for the Council of Ex Muslims and One Loaf Roll. And at that event, the wonderful philosopher AC Grayling spoke about the year that passed and also the year ahead. Stay and listen to this wonderful speech. Ladies and gentlemen, Anthony Grayling. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. It doesn't seem like a, like a year has passed since we were last gathered together, but it has been a, a, a very mixed year, in some respects a very dark and a very tragic year, and it's, it's good to remember the fact that this is a, a struggle which is a, a real struggle with real costs. And there are lots of people in this room, people I know with very moving stories, who um, have to live with courage every day, who uh, have painful memories to, to bear with them, as a result of the fact that they've made a choice to live differently from the traditional ways of thinking about things. Their refusal to accept uh, constraints on their minds, on their feelings, on their lives, on their relationships with other people. There's a huge, huge body of courage in this room as a result. Um, you know you're standing next to people who have stories to tell which are, are, are really moving and really deep. And so we should congratulate one another, support one another, recognize this fact about one another. We know that we live in a, in a country where, relatively speaking at any rate, it's 
safer than some other places. If we look at our friends in Bangladesh, for example, who've really been at the forefront of, of difficulties. But we see, we know that it can be tough here too. I want to take my hat off to Mariam for standing up to a lot of bullying at Goldsmiths recently. You've all seen the footage. <laughs> but this bunch of people are, are on the front line all the time and, and uh, my, my very, very, very warmest wishes to them for a, a much happier and a much more successful 2016. Let's remember this. The reason why we have lights and decorations and we overeat and we party and we have a little bit too much to drink and we give one another presents at this time of year is because of the shorter days. We go back in time, many, many, many centuries, long before uh, today's young, uh, rather oppressive religions uh, got going. So we're going back now two, three, four thousand years. We're going back to a time when the dark and cold time of the year was a time of plenty. After all, the animals had been slaughtered, the, uh, the meat had been pickled, the harvest was in, uh, there was no work to be done in the field, so we could sit around, we could eat, we could drink, we could tell stories, we could have a good time, and because the days were dark, we liked to light a fire, we liked to have some candles burning, we liked to have a good time. Along came the religions and they hijacked it. Now we have to think, uh, you know, a little baby got born and therefore we've got to uh, eat a turkey. The logical connection rather escapes me. But we shouldn't allow these, these uh, traditions to be hijacked. We should enjoy this time of year, and we should take from it something which is of the very first importance in this great endeavor uh, to, to, to make sense of life. We always praise reason and evidence. We praise rationality. You talk about institutions that are devoted to the idea of thinking. You're all very, very familiar with the Rossellian point about you know, how few people do any serious thinking in this world of ours. He said, you remember, most people would rather die than think, and most people do, and consequently, of course, uh, that, that's a, a source of great uh, problems in our world. To get people to think and to be reflective and to really challenge their assumptions and to look at the world through clear eyes, the eyes of reason, that's something that we're very keen to see happen and which our education systems ought to be dedicated to instead of just reprising all those old views and ways of thinking. That's why we want to get rid, for example, of faith schools, so-called, although that phrase, faith school, seems to me to be a paradox in two words. But at the same time, at the same time, it is reasonable to recognize that our emotional lives matter to us greatly, our affections and friendships, our love for one another, and those non-rational, valuable non-rational, not irrational, but non-rational things like hope and like courage. And it is actually hope and courage which is going to make this world a better place. The hope and the courage that we can make it a more rational place. The hope and courage to always strive to try to make people realize this one very, very fundamental fact, that when you meet another human being, you should meet them on the following terms, that it is another human being you're meeting, not a man or a woman or a this or a that or belong to that ethnicity or that religion, to refuse to accept the way people sometimes present themselves to us with some overriding statement of an identity that they want you to respect. No, you respect them as human beings, and most human beings do merit our respect. Remember what uh, uh, Emerson, the American essayist, said, we should give other people what we give a painting. That is the advantage of a good light. Always treat people with kindness and, 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 and with respect to start off with. And only if they show themselves to be unworthy of it do we think about them differently. But if we began by encountering one another as human beings, forget about gender, sexuality, ethnicity, background, forget about anything else, just as human beings, one to another, feeling as we do, sometimes sad, sometimes happy, always striving and yearning, carrying some difficult memories, uh, hoping, wanting to be loved, wanting to give love. If we think about other human beings in these terms, then it's always going to be Christmas. So my very warmest wishes to you all for a, a really happy and wonderful year next year. My great admiration to all of you, to Mariam, to her team, to uh, the uh, Council for Ex-Muslims, to the One Law for All, tremendously important, and it's great that that uh, uh, um, petition has gone in now. But 
let us hope that next year will be more peaceful, that more of us um, will be free of the, of the trammels of difficulty and, and danger that uh, too many of us experience, not us in this relatively peaceful part of the world, although some do, I think, but a better year all around, I, I, I very much hope, because I think, and this may be wishful thinking, but if you want to hear the argument, come and ask me afterwards, but I do think that the wheels of history are going in the right direction, even though it is a very rocky path. So, onward and upwards, happy Christmas to you all, and a happy 2016. enjoyed that wonderful speech by Isaac Grayling. I mean, there's so many points in that brief speech, each of them a gem. Uh, but for me, I think uh, the thing that really stood out was about this whole thing of seeing people as human beings first and foremost, and not identities. And to treat everyone like you would a, a, a painting, Absolutely showing good. it in a good light. I think that's really a beautiful way to live your life. And also the fact that um, Part and parcel of uh, bringing a better society is to have courage and hope. I think these are non-rational, as he said, beautiful, but not quotes, irrational. Not irrational uh, mm. qualities of um, hu human beings, actually, and that's the important thing: having courage and hope to change things for the better. Yeah, definitely. This week's Slice of Life is a nude protest by Milo Moire, a young woman student in Köln. And it's a wonderfully apt protest against the mass sexual assaults that the city saw. It basically is a, you know, a, a, a statement by a woman saying that women have the right to be in the public space completely nude even if they so choose and we've always said nude protest is important part and parcel of protest in this day and age and she actually carried that beautifully and set the bar women have the right to be in public space they they, they should have the right and uh, ability to live and uh, enjoy life without pressure from the misogynist so well done miller and you know your voice and your action hours as well yeah definitely well we've reached the end of our program we hope you enjoyed this week's program unfortunately the wonderful Reza Moradi is no longer able to work with us he, he'll be missed greatly in this program very, you'll see very from, much the, so. <laughs> from program. the quality of <laughs> our uh, program we're not doing that bad okay <laughs> <laughs> but yes we we miss we we miss him greatly uh, and I'm sure you will too anyway hope you have a lovely week and we'll see you again the same time same place next time from both of us goodbye bye And I'm Fadi Bospuya. We're hosting a program called Bread and Roses. It's a weekly program that's broadcast in Persian and English 
in the Middle East and North Africa, primarily Iran as well. And it's also shown on YouTube internationally. And we've been doing this since last May. We're coming up to our year's anniversary and yeah. we, we've had quite a lot of fun making these videos. We discussed taboo breaking, free thinking ideas. The Islamic regime of Iran has called us immoral and corrupt. And that's why the, you need to support us. We are and the alternative voice in Middle East and North Africa. Of corruption and immorality. So do support us. Here's a short video from Patreon that explains how you can help us with even just one dollar a week. That's nothing. Support us. Patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators. It's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. It's more for bloggers or YouTubers or webcomics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream. And in exchange for your support, artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators.